good morning. It's good. Coffee's working. It's great. I looked over, I saw some of our students drinking their coffee, and I'm like, I really need like a cup holder up here. And then we, we would really be set for service. Um, but uh, we're excited that coffee's back. Um, it's good to see all of you here this morning. If it's your first time or maybe it's been a long time since you've been here, my name's Josh. I'm the lead pastor here. And we just want to give you a warm welcome and tell you that it's great to see you. Uh, also, one thing that I do want to touch on right before we dive into uh, the message is we have team conference. That is, uh, this is the first time we've done this, uh, but team conference is going to be a day where we invest in our teams, our dream teams, uh, and that is coming up on Saturday morning, August 29th. It's from 9.30 in the morning till 2 p.m. We will feed you. Uh, it's going to be a great time where we just want to deposit. We want to invest in you. And so we're just carving out one Saturday morning. Uh, if you're on a dream team, you should have already gotten to save the date for that. Uh, if you're not on a dream team, if you've been holding out on going to growth track, or maybe you got a few steps, that's okay. We still would love for you to join us on that Saturday. Uh, you'll get to hear some vision. And again, we are going to invest in uh, you because here, here's our philosophy. We know that the more people we have serving, Studies show, statistics show, and this is probably a made-up statistic. No, it's, it's real. The more people that serve in a church, the greater their reach is. Amen. And why are we on this earth? To reach people. And so that means that we should have a heart to serve, and this gives us an opportunity. And so we want to see more and more people serve. Why? Because we want to see more and more people reached for the kingdom. And so uh, that's my plug. Saturday, August 29th, mark your calendar, save the date. Uh, and I promise it'll be a good lunch, probably Chick-fil-A, because that's uh, God's favorite, and um, it'll be great. So if nothing else, come for some free lunch. And we will have child care, so there's no reason why you can't come unless you can't get off work or you got like a wedding anniversary, vacation, you're planned out of town, all right? Um, last week, we kicked off the series on the Holy Spirit, uh, and so I'm excited to dive into week two, and uh, we talked about a few of the functions of the Holy Spirit last week. We talked about that the Holy Spirit is our advocate, the Holy Spirit is our comforter, the Holy Spirit is our teacher, um, and we kind of address some things because we know that all of us in here, we may not have a a Pentecostal background or uh, uh, an uh, understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and how does the Holy Spirit function in my life and what do the gifts of the Holy Spirit look like. And so that's really what this series is aimed uh, to, to educate, to invest into you, to open your eyes. And uh, we acknowledged last week is uh, that a lot of people may view the Holy Spirit as being weird, but really the Holy Spirit's not weird. People are just weird. And uh, we're all weird, okay? So we, we can just acknowledge that. But here is one thing that we all need to understand is that we need the Holy Spirit. That the life that God has called us to live and intends for us to live, we cannot do it to the fullest, to the extent that God wants without the Holy Spirit. Now here's one of the things that I want you to understand as we kind of get into to week two, is we find the Holy Spirit all through Scripture, now, I think it's very easy for us to fast forward to the New Testament and see the Holy Spirit show up after Jesus ascends back into heaven, but we actually find the Holy Spirit present as early as Genesis chapter 1, verses 2. So the Holy Spirit missed verse 1, but the Holy Spirit shows up verse 2, and it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then we see the Holy Spirit actually uh, come upon certain judges, warriors, prophets, all the way through the Old Testament. So we don't need to think that the Holy Spirit is just a New Testament thing. After Jesus, the Holy Spirit has existed because the Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We see the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus before he embarks on his ministry on this earth. And then one of the more well-known occurrences is the Holy Spirit showing up in Acts 2. And that's going to be our, our text that we're going to start with this morning. And I just want to read the first couple of verses here in Acts 2, uh, starting in verse 1, uh, continuing through verse 3. And it says this, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, 
It's getting my S's this morning. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Verse 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So here in this text, in these few verses that many of us in the room would associate the the falling of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit as we know the Holy Spirit to function, we see the Holy Spirit visualized in two things, wind and fire. Now these are very uh, distinct, different, uh, I guess, items, things, whatever you would call it. And wind, we're going to get into next week. So wind is referenced as power. Wind can create uh, energy, and and wind is is useful for for initiating power. But then fire, oftentimes through Scripture, is seen as judgment. But there's two kind of functions that I see through Scripture in, in fire, and one, when it consumes would be connected to judgment. So uh, fire that burns something up, it consumes whatever is, is burning, would be connected to judgment. But fire that does not consume would be a refining fire. And so we see here in Acts chapter 2 that the fire is not burning those in the upper room. So if it's not consuming them in judgment then we can deduce that the Holy Spirit is refining. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning because fire is either going to consume or it's going to refine. Now, we were at Dollywood uh, a, a little while ago, and, and, um, and Cohen uh, is kind of in this, and, and Cohen's our oldest. He's five, almost, he'll be six this month. And... Um, Cohen is kind of at that age of discovery. I, I don't know if, if, if you just remember being around a five-year-old, almost six-year-old, but he is just curious about everything. He wants to ask questions about everything. He wants to discover everything. And so we're at Dollywood, and, and I just I knew in, in my heart of hearts that he was going to enjoy, and, and I don't know if you've ever been to Gatlinburg Pigeon Forge. They, these places are everywhere. We just happen to be at Dollywood, but they have these, uh, these places where you like um, you mine for jewels. Have you ever done that before? If you haven't, it's a lot of fun. You pay for a, a sack of dirt, and inside there's a bunch of little rocks. And, uh, and so we did. We bought a bag of dirt, and we pour it into a pan, and you begin to put the pan in the water, and all of a sudden these jewels begin to appear. Well, they were there the whole time. But what is the water doing? The water is washing away the filth and the dirt so that the jewels that were there in the first place begin to be seen. But see, Cohen wasn't just satisfied with washing his jewels right there. When we got home back to our house, I find all of his rocks in his sink in his bathroom and he has been running the water. Why? Because he was convinced that he has discovered real jewels. He kept telling Brittany and I... I got real jewels. And he just knew that if I keep cleaning these jewels, if I keep washing, they'll become shinier and shinier. And maybe, maybe I'm going to discover something new inside. See, the role of the Holy Spirit in us is the same way. God created us in his image. But life and choices and decision continue to just put us in this bag of dirt. But the Holy Spirit says, I want to refine you. Because son, daughter, I see in you what God created in you. And it's not to be present in a bag of dirt. It's to be rinsed. It's to be cleansed. It's to be refined. And so when we look at this scripture, the Holy Spirit functions to refine us. Now the Bible uses another word for refining, and it's this word called sanctification. Now, if you've grown up in church, maybe you've heard the term sanctification. But if we're being really honest, most of us probably are not using this word sanctification in our everyday vocabulary. We would maybe even say it is an irrelevant word in the English language. Because I don't even know how I would use sanctification in a normal sentence other than referencing something I read in Scripture or how my life is being sanctified through the Holy Spirit. 
But in the same connection, and, and one of the commentaries I was reading this, this week, it, it referenced that the term sanctification, although maybe irrelevant, could be connected just like medical terms. There are a lot of medical terms that we may not use in our everyday language, but when our life depends on it, we're grateful that that language exists. And in the same way, our life depends on this term sanctification. Why? Because God created us with something so much more than we can experience just on our own. And the Holy Spirit intends to sanctify or refine our life so that we can be who God created us to be. This term sanctification actually comes from uh, a couple of Latin words that means exactly this, make holy. To make holy. God wants to sanctify or refine us by his spirit. To make us holy. We find in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 2, and, and he's speaking to Christians here. Who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkle with his blood. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 through 8. For God did not call us to be impure but to live a holy life, to live a refined life, to live a sanctified life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 23. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sanctification, refining, God wanting to do a work in us through his Holy Spirit. What's the key to this process? What's this key to refining? It is obedience. Why does God want to refine us? Why does God want to sanctify us so that we would be obedient to his will for our lives? He created us in his image with his purpose, not our purpose for our lives, his purpose for our lives. And the only way we can fully experience that is to be refined. So the question we're going to answer today, how does the Holy Spirit refine us? What does this look like today for my life, for your life? Because a lot of us came in and we've got some filth, we've got some grime, we can acknowledge that. All of us have some things in our life that need to be refined. So you may sit here today and hear, oh, pastor, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm great. I'm okay. Well, God wants you to be more than okay. God wants you to be more than good. God is calling us to be holy. And the only way that we can experience that holiness, that refining, is through his Holy Spirit. So the first thing that I want us to talk about, how does the Holy Spirit refine us? The Holy Spirit refines us through conviction. Through conviction. John 16, 7 through 9 says this. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, this is key here, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. Now, conviction is kind of this churchy word. Again, this is probably a word that I, I, I don't know that I really hear outside of church circles, outside of how does Scripture apply to my life, and, and conviction is kind of one of the, So if you haven't grown up in church, I'm going to give you a little context of what conviction means. Conviction means to, to bring to light, to expose. It is not a question if we, if we will know sin to be sin. It is a question of if we will respond and be obedient to the Holy Spirit. See, I think a lot of times we, we like to use these excuses. Well, I, I, Pastor, I don't really know if that's wrong. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. I don't have to stand up here and tell everybody each week what's wrong in your life. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit can do a far better job of that than I ever can. I will mess things up if I, if I stand up here every week and just try and, hey, let's just address the, the list of sin. You know what's really going to happen? I'm going to address all of your sin that I know to be present, and I'm never going to touch on any of mine. 
Because that's the way we work in our natural sense. We can point out everybody else, everything that's wrong with everybody else. But we don't want to talk about what's wrong with us. And it's not that we don't know something's wrong with us. It's a lot of times we just don't want to admit it. We don't want to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit that is already at work convicting us. Now, this is not condemning us. There's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Condemnation says you're, you're, you're low, you can't ever get out of this, you're, 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 you're doomed. Conviction says there is something that is better for your life than how you are living right now, and it's time to change. And we have to make the choice of how will we respond to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will use God's word to convict us. But you know what we have is a problem in this, in not only the U.S., I think just around the world, we have a biblical literacy problem. People don't understand how or don't choose to understand how to read their scripture. I'm not convinced it's a time issue. I know a lot of people, that's the first, well, I just don't have time to be on a daily Bible reading plan. I don't have time in my schedule to carve out. No, it's you are making a choice not to get into God's word. And oftentimes, I think the root of that is you know that God's word is going to call you to live a better life than what you're living today. So what's the easiest way? We just avoid it. We just avoid it. We just don't get into scripture because we would rather not understand it than understand it and carry around that weight that God's calling us to do something better with our life. That's the Holy Spirit convicting us. That feeling you get deep inside when you start to read scripture and and you may even feel like this is impossible from where I am. But with God, all things are possible. So it doesn't matter how much dirt you carried in today. Scripture says that when we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us, to cleanse us. So what the enemy may want you to think is not possible through the Holy Spirit's conviction is possible for you to live a different life, to make different decisions. Holy Spirit will convict us with, from spiritual voices in our life. But oftentimes the people who tell us what we need to hear versus what we want to hear are the voices we try and push away. Because we would rather, if we, have, if we have an issue, if we have, we, we want to gather people that we feel like can agree on that issue versus the people that will look at us and say, no, you're wrong. No, this is how you should walk. This is the decisions that you should make. The Holy Spirit will bring conviction through relationships in your life. But if I'm being honest, when that conviction comes, if we don't make a a choice and a decision to change our ways, to change the way we're living our life, then we become hardened. We begin to turn down the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, I love this passage in Acts 2. This is following. So the Holy Spirit has descended, has filled the disciples. He's shown up on the scene. And then we find Peter, he is preaching. Because... Like we'll talk about next week, when we receive the Holy Spirit, there is power to do something and a call for our life. And so we find Peter here in verses 37 and 38 of chapter 2. When the people heard what he was saying, when they heard the message, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Because here they're experiencing, they are cut to the heart. This is conviction in its greatest sense because it pierces. We don't understand how it's happening or what's happening, but we feel that that thing in our gut that just says something's got to change. And what should be the next? What do I do about it, God? I'm convicted and, and, and you've pierced my heart. Now what do I do? Peter replies, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, the problem with most of us, our first response is just to deny rather than to change. It's to deny that we have a sin issue in our heart. And you you may be wondering, well, Pastor, what's sin? Can we talk about it? Can we define that? Here's what I believe sin to be. Anything other than God's best for my life. There are a lot of gray areas when we talk about sin. I even believe that my sin may look different than your sin. Why? Because if sin is keeping me from what God intended for my life, anything that would keep me from what God intended for my life is sin. So there may be sin things that I struggle with or I wrestle with or I'm going to have to navigate through in my life that look different than yours. 
That's why the Holy Spirit brings conviction. It's not man's job to point out and say, hey, here's all the list. Because I don't believe that we could produce a comprehensive list of all the sin that we will struggle and face in this life. But for me personally, I've made a decision. Sin is anything that's going to keep me from God's best. Because God, if you have a plan and a purpose for my life, which I know to be true, anything that would separate me from that is sin. And I want God's best, which means I have to make a choice. Every time we ignore the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we're just muffling His voice. We're just putting a cover. We're turning the speaker down. And He's saying, listen to me. Listen to me, son. Listen to me, daughter. Because I have something better for you. We have to allow the conviction to bring change for our life. The second thing, the Holy Spirit refines us through trials. The Holy Spirit refines us through trials. I read this this week. It is no more possible to become refined painlessly than it is to be burned painlessly. Think about that for a moment. It's, it's no more possible to become refined painlessly than it is to be burned painlessly. I have two little boys. I don't want them to learn lessons the hard way. Just the other day, I'm getting on to Jensen because he's just running circles in the kitchen like Probably every three-year-old just running around our kitchen island as fast as he can, probably playing tag with his brother. I don't know. But I'm cooking the stoves on. We have gas. So I'm like freaking out. Jensen, you have got to stop. Jensen, you've got to stop. And he almost gets burned. Here's what I know. It's only going to take one good burn, and he'll never do that again. Now, I don't want him to be burned. Okay, don't hear me walk out. Man, pastor is cruel this morning. He was a three-year-old to be burned. I don't want him to be burned because I know the pain that he will go through if that takes place. But all it's going to take is one good burn for him to realize, I never want to do that again. All it takes is one good trial in our life for us to go through a refiner's fire and realize, I don't want to go back through that. So God, whatever you're teaching me through this trial, I want to learn it the first time through. And if you walk through some trials, you know that that is a true statement. But purity comes through the refiner's fire. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, in, in, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through, it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ. James 1, 2 through 4, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I, I know this scripture, I love this scripture, but this scripture is really hard for me to, I just feel like it's, I don't know. Consider it joy whenever you face trials. Like, James, really? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This does not sound fun. Consider it joy when you're going through a tough time. If somebody looks at you and you're going, I mean, just think, the worst day, the worst trial you've ever had, and your, your best friend shows up and says, just count it joy. Put a smile on your face that your world is falling in on you. Find joy in the most difficult and painful moments of your life. But why do we read this in Scripture? Because it is the perseverance. It is the continued pursuit. It is the refining process. If we will keep pressing through, that we will find joy. We will experience joy because the Holy Spirit is refining our life. Washing away all the dirt and grime. All the immaturity that all of us have regardless of our age. That the Holy Spirit is working through us. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Purity is a process. Sanctification, refining is a process of where we have to go through. And sometimes it's a grind and sometimes it's trials and difficult situations. But it rids us of our selfish nature. It defines where our dependence may lie. 
Think about when you've gone through a difficult time in your life. Where do you lean? What is your natural response? Because I know for me, I, I am wired that I want to rely on people to receive comfort before I rely on the Holy Spirit. That's just a, a personal con- confession. Most of us in the room would probably feel that way. That our nat- we, have to, we have to retrain our thinking to recognize that when we're going through difficult situations, God is refining us through this, and we've got to continue to rely on Him. Why would God bring trials? Why would God bring difficulties? And I don't always think that it's God bringing the trial. Although I do think that God brings trials to our life. But I don't think it's always God bringing the tragedy or bringing the difficult situation. But he allows it because he knows he has us. He wants us to learn through the process. Charles Spurgeon said this, trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil and let us see what we are made of. Whew. When I read that this week, I'm just like, oh, some days I don't want people digging up my soil to see what's there. Because I know for all of us, it's, we may have some root issues that we really don't want to look at. I don't, I, and I know I made this confession, I hate gardening, I hate plants, I hate any of that. Brittany's becoming a plant lady, I'm like, you go for it. Not me. You know why? Because you get in the dirt. There's no way to do it other than just getting your hands dirty. And sometimes I'd rather walk out with clean hands because it's the appearance that everything's good than to really get dirty and recognize what's at stake here. But when we get under the soil, we begin to see really what is happening. Do we have a healthy root system? Are our roots getting the nutrients that they need from the right places? Got this? Quite, what are you made of? What's under your soil? The Holy Spirit is at work in us, refining us through our most difficult of trials if we let him. See, our humanity wants to minimize our connection with the Lord in these difficult times. We we don't naturally seek and say, oh, Lord, I'm going through a hard time. I need you. Oftentimes we say, I need this or I need that. Or if this would happen, I I would feel better about my life or have more confidence. Really, all we need is a greater level of trust. Trials refine us. We have to make the choice to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit during those times and ask that question, God, what is your spirit working out in me? Because for many of us, and if you've lived long enough, you've probably walked through some of the same trials over and over. And you may ask this question, why am I back? I just feel like I've just gone in a circle. I'm just walking in a circle, and I I, I feel like I'm just having deja vu. I'm here again. And our prayer oftentimes is, God, get me out of this. When it should be, God, what are you trying to teach me? What can I learn? What are you trying to refine in me? And we can make that choice. And lastly, this morning, the Holy Spirit refines us so that we can produce fruit. That's what it's all about. Why are we convicted? Why do we go through trials? To produce fruit. Everything God does is on purpose with a purpose. God doesn't just do things by accident. Things aren't just happening in your life by accident. Everything God does in us is for his glory. Why? So that others can see the work in us, so that they too may experience the work of the Lord. When we are refined by the Holy Spirit, we produce fruit. It's pruning. It's fertilizing. It's watering. I never even realized until a few weeks ago that there's this thing called Water Wednesday to remind you to water your plants. I guess nobody else waters your plants either. You probably have just as much luck as I do keeping things alive. (laughs) Evidently, there's this thing out there called Water Wednesday, and Brittany's alarm goes off every Wednesday, and that's one of the boys' chores to go water the plants. It's great. Just can't wait till they can mow the grass and take out the garbage. But it is a process to bear fruit. We had a, we had a, I think it was a, was it an orange tree that we had in Florida or was it a lemon tree? I don't even know because we were there 10 years and that thing still wasn't producing fruit. Why? Because I had no idea what I was doing. 
I think that thing eventually died, didn't it? And we put a trampoline in its place. That's a much better option. The Holy Spirit refines us to produce fruit. That is the goal, that we may be obedient so that our life would produce fruit so that others may see. Galatians 5, 16 through 17 says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Church, we are at war between our spirit man and our flesh. And I don't really think I even have to tell you that for you to recognize that we battle our flesh. I battle my flesh every day. Whether I'm going to get up, whether I'm going to sleep in. Whether I'm going to be kind to people, whether I'm going to be short-tempered with people. I, I... I have to make that choice every day. There's so much in our flesh and in this world that wants to define us, but our Creator wants to refine us for His purpose so that we can produce fruit. And we find these fruits in Galatians 5, 22 through 26, on down in the passage. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. I'm saying these slow so you get them. Peace. Patience. Should probably pause there for a few minutes just to let that one sink in. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Keep in step with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit refines so that we can keep in step and produce fruit. See, for me, when I taste fruit, I know exactly where it came from. I can tell you real quick if it's good fruit or bad fruit. Have you ever bitten into like a, oh, that just makes me even queasy. Like Cohen, he won't eat a banana with black spots on it at all, you know? Because I think just when we come into this world, we know good fruit and bad fruit when we taste it. We don't have to go through an education class to recognize what fruit is good and what fruit is bad. And I think some of the basic lessons in a child's life are learning. Maybe we associate them with colors or letters or whatever, but they they know what bananas are and apples are and oranges are. Why? Because it is easy to recognize fruit. All over the world, we could recognize fruit. Now, there's some strange fruits out there. I don't know if you... I've been in Publix lately, and they've got this like massive... I think it's like a dragon fruit or something. I don't know. It's massive. I just want to buy it one time just to see what it is. I wouldn't know that fruit if I tasted it, but all the other fruits I would know. And the same thing goes for our life. I don't believe people have to take a a 16-week course on what the fruit of the Spirit is to recognize if it's of God or or if it's not. I don't think we have to be members and, and, and have been in church our entire life for us to know what is of God and what is not. Why? Because fruit... Is the, is, is the reflection of the Holy Spirit in us. That list in Galatians 5 is not possible by ourselves. Show me the best person you know in my life. It can be your great-great-grandma that you never, you never heard say a foul word. You never, you never saw him do anything. I can promise you she was full of the Holy Spirit if she was living a pure life. That fruit was not by accident. So many times we just, we blaze on through this. We may learn the fruits of the Spirit early on in our life, but we neglect to live them out because we've neglected to allow the Holy Spirit to continue to refine us. But we've got to make that choice. You know, we moved into our house, I guess a couple of months back, but we had kind of, all of our stuff had been in storage for almost two years before it got moved into the house. But I don't know the last time you've moved 
But let me just tell you, I, I'm just, side note, one of the things I love about Brittany, she is a refiner. She is a purger. Almost to the extent where I'll ask where something's at, and she's like, I think I may have thrown that away. I mean, she is just constantly refining. But when we went to move, one of the things she did, things that were of no use, they weren't any good anymore, she didn't bring those with us. She got rid of them. Why? Because they are no longer needed. So if they're no longer needed, they're taking up space that could be used for other things. Sometimes the refining process that the Holy Spirit wants to do in us is cleaning out things that we may look and say, oh, well, that's okay. I mean, we had kitchen gadgets. I don't even know. We probably had, I was trying to think of a random one and I can't right now, but um, you, if you've got kitchen gadgets, you just know, you, you like pull it out, you're like, what is this? You know, like the egg beater crank, like crank, like, and if you use one of those, I, I apologize this morning. But, yeah, I mean, who, who cranks this thing? Just get a whisk or a fork out, you know? It got this whole contraption. That thing is taking up space that I could have, like, new knives for the kitchen or something. I mean, way better. And the same thing in our life. The Holy Spirit wants to refine and clean out some stuff in you and in me that's taking up wasted space. Because he wants to do a new work in you. He wants to bring out everything that God created you for. And he can't do it when we're holding on to the junk in our life. Or maybe you've got some filth and grime behind the refrigerator or washer and dryer. You ever move one of those out after 20 years of being in the same house? 30 years being in the same house? You can't even tell what you cooked and spilled back there, you know, behind the stove. But you know something went back there. I mean, it is just gross. The same thing in our life. Most of us, we don't move on to another location because we don't want to go through that painful process. The cleanup. Do not let that be the story of your life. That you stay in the same place. God's called you to a new season. God's called you to a new place. But you're afraid when he starts moving the fridge, when he starts moving the washer and dryer, when he starts moving the stove, you don't want him to see what's there. He already knows it's there. That's why the Holy Spirit's been convicting you. That's why the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to keep that stuff hidden any longer. The Holy Spirit wants you to experience freedom, cleansing, refining. Now is the time for us to make the decision. The action today is repent. Whatever you have in your life that God wants to work out, whether it's through conviction, whether it's through trials, so that you can produce fruit, repent. Allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse your life so that you can step into everything that God has for you. Because that's what He desires. He wants a holy, a pure, a spotless bride. And the only way we can do that is when we allow the Holy Spirit to refine us. So I want you to bow your heads with me this morning. Whether you're tuning in online, whether you're here in the building, you say, Pastor, I I need to experience life change. You talk about repenting, I just need to to make the decision to follow Jesus. Well, that's a good first step. I just want us all to repeat this prayer after us. And if you are making that decision, mean it in your heart. But let's repeat this prayer. Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Help me to love you. Help me to follow you all of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you made that decision today, we want you to fill out a connection card and you just put, made a decision to follow Christ today. Why? Because we want to journey with you. Because there's a lot of grind, there's a lot of built, there's a lot of dirt that we're going to face in our life. And we're not meant to do it by ourselves. But here's what I want you to do. We're going to stand and we're going to worship together. I think that for all of us, repentance should be an active practice in our life. You know why? Because we are constantly going through that refining process. And the moment we stop opening up our heart and saying, Holy Spirit, search me. If there's anything that keeps me back from your best for my life, get rid of it. The moment we stop praying those prayers, we have put a lid on our life. We have, we have stopped at the, at the road. We've, we've stopped progressing to where God wants us to. 
And so I want to encourage you, church, as we worship today, begin to pray that prayer. Maybe it's been a long time. God, cleanse my heart. Forgive me. I repent of where I'm wrong. Holy Spirit, refine me today. Can we stand and let's worship as we close today?